So now that we've learned just how deadly that chronic kidney disease is and how much it can affect the whole body, let's talk about what are our goals, um, priorities, and treatments for this patient. And a lot of these are going to look similar to what they did for acute kidney injury, but there might there's just a little bit more and some more specifics that we're going to go into. So our overall goals are to preserve, reduce, prevent, and improve. So we want to preserve whatever kidney function that we do have left as much as we can keep it. This is, remember, progressive and irreversible when it gets to a certain point. Um, and so we want to preserve and hold on to whatever kidney function, do whatever we can not to hurt the kidneys. We want to reduce cardiovascular disease and risk factors. Um, because remember that cardiovascular disease and that kidney disease are closely linked. Um, and if one is going sour, the other one's usually going to go downhill too. So if we can prevent cardiovascular disease, we can also prevent some kidney disease and kidney um, uh, difficulty or like worsening of kidney disease. We want to prevent complications in these patients. There's a lot of life and death complications. And then we also want to improve their comfort because this is a chronic illness. So we want to support them. So how are we going to meet these overall priorities? How are we going to preserve whatever kidney function they have? We want to diagnose them early. If we know about this early, we can do everything we can to try to support them, to find out like, hey, this is a person who already has kidneys that get hurt feelings. So anytime we're in a situation where their kidneys could get hurt feelings, we want to support them, give them hydration, uh, make sure that they have everything that they need when they're early in that kidney disease um, so that we can prevent them from progressing and getting into the later stages. Um, we always want to detect and treat any reversible causes of kidney damage. So think things like dehydration, like we talked about. Treat their hypertension so they get good flow to their kidneys. Prevent infections that can overwhelm the kidneys. And then also um, the medications that we have to give for infections that also hurt the kidneys. Um, avoid nephrotoxic drugs. And of course, try to prevent obstructions from happening as well. We also want to reduce those cardiovascular risk factors. So again, controlling high blood pressure, making sure that they're taking their medications regularly, even if they're not having symptoms of hypertension, even if they think their blood pressure is fine or they did their medications pointless, taking that is going to be so key. Because remember, again, having high blood pressure doesn't mean good flow. It actually can mean decreased flow a lot of the times. We want to control those plaques that are building up in their blood vessels. Because remember, everything that has to do with the flow to the kidneys has to do with those blood vessels and having an open blood vessel, not a blood vessel full of plaque. We want to manage their diabetes and prevent their diabetes if they don't already have it. Um, if keeping a good stable blood glucose, if they have diabetes and preventing them from getting diabetes is going to help to decrease some of those risk factors. Because remember how bad diabetes is for the blood vessels um, and everything, a lot of medications and stuff and treatments that would be needed for the diabetes can also hurt the kidneys as well. Um, we also want to manage their electrolyte imbalances as a whole, because remember anything that goes off with the kidneys or goes off with the heart, can, they can affect each other. And um, teaching them general lifestyle management, diet and exercise, that DASH diet, things like that is going to be really helpful for them. We also want to prevent complications. So remember, they can all, they can have those life-threatening electrolyte imbalances like hyperkalemia. So they need to be on EKG monitoring, and then I can give them those hyperkalemia treatments that I talked about in my other PowerPoint, my AKI PowerPoint. You know, the trifecta, the insulin D50 and calcium, the Kxalate, um, the you know changes to their diet so that they're not having so much uh, potassium, things like that. Those are all the things that I want to try to do to manage that hyperkalemia long long term. Uh, manage other electrolyte imbalances. Make sure they're on a renal diet to support what, what they nutrients that they're missing. And then also uh, making sure they're not getting too much of certain nutrients. And we'll talk about that later. Um, managing their cardiovascular risk factors. Keeping in mind that when we put them on a diet, they really need to be on a cardiovascular and renal diet. Now, most of the people think that the cardiovascular diet sucks, the renal diet's worse. And if you have to be on both, it's like there's like nothing you can eat. <laughs> not really, but you know, it's it's very, very um, restrictive. Um, we want to prevent fractures because remember they have that vitamin D calcium, um, you know, mismatch. Um, and so we want to um, decrease their phosphorus because the other thing is, is that um, if your calcium is too low or too high, um, you're going to break down calcium um, and it causes your bones to be more fragile. So as a whole, we want to keep phosphorus levels steady because otherwise when your calcium's off, everything gets off. We also are going to give supplemental, a supplemental vitamin D and calcium as needed. Um, because of all the anemia problems that they're going to have, we want to administer blood 
as they need it, depending on their symptoms and their blood levels, we're going to give them back. Remember, they're missing that erythropoietin or that EPO. They're missing that hormone. So since they're missing that hormone, I'm um, actually can replace it. There's subcutaneous injections that they can get for that. Um, also iron administration. A lot of these patients um, are lacking iron. So if I can replace it, I can prevent a lot of that anemia they're experiencing. They're also going to be higher risk for infection. So doing aseptic technique and teaching them ways to prevent infection themselves can help to provide better outcomes. I want to also improve their comfort, psychosocial support, therapeutic communication. Um, a dialysis is really important. A lot of the like uncomfortable symptoms they have, if they get that fluid and those, um, that, those waist off, they're going to feel better. They're going to be tired, but they're going to feel better than what they did before. Um, fatigue, um, you know, trying to teach them energy conservation, frequent rest, you know, managing that long-term. The itching in their skin, we can use hydroxyzine or diphenhydramine or Benadryl, um, you know, to kind of help to um, decrease some of that in itching. Also giving them psychosocial support. So um, for anxiety, and depression. So medications for their anxiety and depression, counseling, therapeutic um, communication as a whole is so key. So medications that are given for chronic kidney disease, we talked about for the hyperkalemia, we have the insulin glucose, the D50 and the calcium gluconate IV, or they can get the K-exalate, which is the polystyrene sulfonate. Um, we also wanna give them medications for their blood pressure, like antihypertensives. Um, patients that are diabetic and have chronic kidney disease, ACE inhibitors are shown to help decrease the decline of kidney function in patients with diabetes that have kidney issues. So um, ACE inhibitors and ARBs can be helpful for those patients just with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. If you remember, ACE inhibitors in general are hard on the kidneys and they increase your potassium, which we usually don't want. But specifically for diabetics, they, uh, there's a special mechanism of action that they have specifically for diabetic patients that is kidney protective. Um, we also give phosphate binders. Remember we were talking about we want to keep the phosphorus level steady. So phosphate binders bind in the bowel. So you have to take these with your meals because they're literally going to bind phosphorus that you're taking in through your food. Um, there's calcium-based ones and non-calcium-based ones. They can cause constipation, so we do want to warn the patient about them. But you're going to take these with your meals to help get that extra phosphorus that you're holding on to and help get rid of it. Um, vitamin D uh, administration, all these patients that um, long-term are usually going to be on a daily dose of vitamin D by mouth. Um, and then also uh, we give sometimes calcium replacements or calcium mimicking agents, um, things like that, that are going to um, help to balance that ele those electrolytes that are off. Like we mentioned, we wanna repl replace that erythropoietin, that EPO, it can be given sub-Q injection. Here's a couple, there's the epoetin or the darbopoietin, um, and both of these um, can help to increase those levels. We wanna find a nice balance for this. We don't want them to have a ton of blood cells. Um, they're at higher risk for cardiac events already. Um, it can cause hypertension to um, stimulate too much of this. So we wanna have, you know, start low and go the lowest possible. We wanna stimulate where they have, you know, they're making enough blood cells, but not where they're getting crazy with it and where they can have um, abnormal or uh, serious complications from this medication. We also want to give them iron supplementation. Um, so if you remember back in adult when we learned about iron supplementation, it's given usually PO, there's lots of GI side effects. Most people do not um, tolerate them on an empty stomach, but they're best taken on an empty stomach um, with a glass of orange juice or some vitamin uh, C. So um, they should not be taken at the same time as phosphate binders. Keep in mind in general, phosphate binders, they bind to things. And so most of the time, anything that's a binder, we don't want to take it with other medications because a lot of times it's going to bind to other medications and make them ineffective. Um, it also can darken your stools. It can cause constipation. These patients may need IV iron. Know that IV iron stains very badly. So when you're administering it, be careful. You don't want to lose a pair of scrubs over some IV iron. Um, this patient also needs things to support them making red blood cells like folic acid. Um, and um, it's also, uh, if they're on dialysis, folic acid, uh, what do you call it, can end up getting removed. So a lot of times that's why they need that extra replacement. They need their vitamins. So there's different diets depending on where you're at in your kidney disease. If I am 
before, I, I should say, if I have not started dialysis yet, the general diet that I want to do before I'm in stage, when I'm just in chronic kidney disease, I'm progressing through the stages, it's really going to depend on each patient. But as a whole, I may need a fluid restriction. It depends on how much urine I'm making. I need to have adequate calories, adequate or low protein. Because when before, um, before I start dialysis, I do not want to overload my kidneys because when they have to process proteins, um, it's really, it's really hard for them. Like it overwhelms them. So I don't, I want to have an adequate amount, not nothing crazy or a little bit on the low side of normal, um, low sodium. It's going to help me with my cardiovascular risk factors and also help so I don't retain too much fluid, low phosphorus, because remember, I'm holding on to that, and then low potassium, because I'm also not getting rid of that very well. Everything else is just going to depend on the actual patient. One, if I get on heme, there's two types of dialysis and there's a different PowerPoint that talks about those. But if I have a patient that they've progressed to end-stage renal and now they're getting hemodialysis, most of these patients are gonna be on a fluid restriction. That's gonna be their urine output plus about 600 to a liter um, on top of that, whatever they're putting out, plus they get about an allowance of 600 to a liter. And that's how much um, their restriction is gonna be. It depends on how much urine they're making. Um, they need to be receiving adequate calories, um, normal or moderate protein, because when you start getting on dialysis, you start losing protein. So that's why once you get on dialysis, normal or actually a moderate amount is okay. <coughs> and then again, you want the low sodium, low potassium, low phosphorus. On the other hand, um, if a patient's on peritoneal dialysis, it's going to be a little different. Um, and so what, if you go watch that dialysis video, it'll make more sense with this. But effectively, on a, uh, if a patient's on peritoneal dialysis, they actually don't usually need a fluid restriction. And that's because in peritoneal dialysis, it's more of a continuous throughout the day um, where you're more regular getting rid of fluid. Hemodialysis is a couple times a week, so you build up the fluid. In peritoneal dialysis, um, you're not building up that same fluid. It's kind of a continuous, um, you can have continuous peritoneal dialysis or every night. So you're really getting that fluid exchange where you don't need to worry about the fluid restriction the same. Um, you want adequate calories and you need to include the calories that you're going to get from your dialysate, from your, uh, your peritoneal dialysis, because sometimes there's a sugar and things in there. Um, again, normal or moderate protein, because there can actually be a lot of protein loss on peritoneal dialysis. So we want to make sure that we're supplementing that if necessary. And then again, low sodium, low potassium, and low phosphorus. So what can I do as the nurse? As a whole, you want to monitor their intake and output, um, teach and reinforce education that is given to them because this is a chronic disease. And um, as you know, they can have the altered mental status and changes with the buildup of all of the um, waste. So we want to make sure that we are reinforcing and supporting them in that education. We're going to monitor for complications, try to increase their comfort, um, positioning them upright. A lot of these patients have trouble breathing. So we want to support their airway breathing and circulation and then treat their symptoms. Um, overall teaching, you know, I want to teach them their diet, what foods to restrict, what are healthy food choices, not just to treat their kidney disease, but also to prevent other things like that cardiovascular disease. Um, if they uh, are going to, they're probably going to be at some point, they're going to be on a fluid restriction. So teaching them how to measure that, what counts in a fluid restriction, and also how to reduce their thirst. We're also going to, um, uh, what do you call it? teach them of signs and symptoms of electrolyte imbalances because those can be life-threatening and they need to seek help right away. We're going to give them very important medication education, which ones, when they should be taking them, um, and then also which ones not to take together. <coughs> and then signs of a complication. So especially once they get to like that in-stage renal where they're on dialysis, if they gain more than four pounds in between treatments, um, that's usually a sign of a, a bigger problem. So they need to be reporting intent, um, you know, great weight gain, um, shortness of breath, increasing fatigue or weakness or confusion, because those can all be signs that something's getting worse or their chronic kidney disease is progressing or something's not working. Um, so definitely need to report those to their doctor. So that's the overall general treatments of chronic kidney disease, kind of getting you started um, and seeing how we treat these patients who have a lot going on. Hope this was helpful. Talk to you later.